Uh, thank you, Mary, Minister, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, uh, it's a pleasure to be back for three in a row at Miguel. I want to commend Joe Mulholland, Mary Clare and their team on once again producing uh, against the odds an excellent school, against the odds of a recession and a never extending dull term, which I suspect probably gave Joe more heartache than anything else. Um, but it is uh, very good to be here. And I want to agree with what Martin has said. It's good to be actually focusing on what is the biggest issue facing the country, that is jobs, jobs create, job creation, protecting those jobs that we already have. And I think, I know the school celebrates Patrick McGill, the writer, but Patrick McGill is also an entrepreneur. Uh, I understand that um, at the age of 21, he self-published a book, uh, Gleanings from a Navi Scrapbook, and then proceeded to sell 7,000 of those books on a door-to-door -door, uh, mission around the cities of Scotland. So it's good that we put the focus of Patrick McGill as an entrepreneur uh, in the highlights and as a job creator uh, in his own right. I want to respond to the Chair's uh, invitation on a number of issues. And firstly, to respond to the events of last Thursday in Brussels. And I actually genuinely think, more importantly, uh, the events of yesterday and today in the Bank of Ireland. The deal in Brussels is superb, and it puts a little bit of uh, hope back into the system. But more importantly, the deal secured for Bank of Ireland is the first independent international investor confidence in this country in some time. And the signal that that sends uh, is far more important than any other that has been sent in some time. However, that signal needs to be reciprocated here locally uh, by that very banking system. And I think any discussion about job creation or any discussion around employment cannot ignore the fact that we still do not have a functioning banking system in this country. If you're a small business person, if you're in business, if you're in, trying to trade in any sector at the moment, getting finance and getting capital uh, from a bank is near to nigh impossible, particularly for experienced, for old businesses. We're not looking for a return to the madness uh, that was lending practices that have us where we are today. And I think until we resolve that issue, job creation, particularly in the SME sector, will be uh, in abeyance. I'm going to give you a small example. I met a gentleman uh, who is an employer in, in my own constituency at the weekend. Uh, he is a world beater. Uh, he set up an industry 25 years ago that now trades from the very far reaches of the west coast of Ireland around the world. Uh, he has reinvented that industry on two different occasions. At one stage he employed 100 people. He then subsequently employed 20. Today he employs 80 uh, with a world beating technology product. His ongoing working capital requirement is 600,000 euro. And he was offered from his local bank, uh, after four months of negotiations, 5,000 euro. This man is what Glenn Diplex was when you were formed. And he has the potential to make that 80 into 100, and make that 100 into 120. But because we are where we are in terms of our banking system, he is stuck in the slow lane of international technology. And he is the kind of champion of the domestic economy, of the domestic spend uh, that we need to support. And really, I, until we get that issue resolved, talking about lifting the cap on banker salaries is quite frankly disgusting for people like him who are in that situation, who through no fault of their own are trying to keep the door open for the want of finance. And if we get the signal like we did yesterday from the international investors, I ask that the local, those getting the benefit of that investment would send a similar such signal by opening up their lending to viable businesses who have a future and who will create employment in this economy. And I think, Minister, the most important thing that you potentially have on your desk at the moment, in addition to JLC reform and everything else, is the, export, uh, is the credit insurance scheme, which I know that you're working on and is due to be launched in September. Uh, that will be the first sign, the first chink of light that we can give to SMEs. But that in itself will not be enough uh, until the amount of money that is being invested through several recapitalizations makes its way onto Main Street and Glenties, or Main Street wherever. And that is how we will protect existing employment and grow employment more in such of the companies that I have referred to. I think we have to be, I agree with Martin, we need to be laser-like in uh, focusing on what we can create jobs, and particularly create sustainable domestic jobs. Uh, I know tomorrow morning you're going to focus on agriculture, and agriculture has so long been the Cinderella of Irish life, but Cinderella is finally getting to go to the ball. And I think the session tomorrow will give those of you who maybe aren't as associated or attached as some of us are 
the example of where agriculture will be at if we properly follow the all-party agreement, the government agreement in Harvest 2020 and the various signals. But there are other areas as well. I just want to focus on one of those tonight, and that's the whole area of creation of jobs in the renewable sector. It has been talked about, and more wind has been expended on talking about renewables, uh, that if we could put a turbine on that, uh, we'd probably, uh, probably fuel half the country. But let's maybe bring it all together and show where the stats are. Uh, there's a high-level action group on green enterprise, and it is estimated that the renewable sector between now and 2020, which is actually only nine years away, believe it or not, we can create 50,000 jobs. And the joy of these 50,000 jobs is that many of them can be tailored, targeted, with an investment of retraining at those who are currently unemployed because of the collapse in construction. The mainly young men who may face no future unless we produce some sort of challenge to reskill them and to give them an outlet for those skills. And renewables is the way to do that. The global market next year for environmental goods and services is something like 1,500 billion euro. The value of the Irish market in 2008 was only 2.8 billion, and renewable energies accounted for only 700 million of that. So we're a long way off where we possibly could be. There are 6,500 people employed today in the renewable energy sector. It's a long way from 6,500 to 50,000. We are blessed. Nobody needs to be told in Glenties uh, that we are blessed with the strength and the power of our wind. We are equally blessed with the strength and power of the water off our shores. And our ocean territory uh, is ten times our land size. The uh, various estimates uh, have shown that by harnessing that wind, by harnessing those waves, Ireland could have eventually, in a very short time, become a net exporter of power rather than the importer depending on an interconnector at the end of another interconnector, as we are at the moment. But we're falling behind. We're falling behind Scotland, and we're falling behind the Nordic companies. I'll just give you an example again of how we can actually, this can make a difference. Those of you who have a bit of time tomorrow, if you're not going swimming, uh, take a look at what's happening in Kitty Bags at the moment. Kitty Bags was once our flagship fishing port, uh, is now sustaining a very basic existence, which could be so much greater. Uh, out of importing wind turbines. And if we got our act together as an island, not just uh, uh, as one part of the island, as an island, then there could be a lot more for Kitty Beggs. And that is why in order for us to maximize that potential and to get that 50,000 jobs created between now and 2020, we need to think outside the box. There is no wind doesn't worry about borders. Our waves don't worry about borders, except those we impose upon them. I think in the concept in the, of new era and in the context of what's going on at the moment in government uh, revising the interconnector deal, we should look at establishing an all-island approach to this, an all-island energy company that will drive home renewals and will drive home the gap that is there between ourselves and other countries. We have to examine the tax treatment in order that there will be a common tax treatment on both parts of the island. But most importantly of all, we have to examine the planning laws, which in every planning jurisdiction are different depending on the size of the project that you do. Surely a small island of just over 5.5 million people, we can agree one planning framework for the benefit of creating 50,000 jobs uh, in, in this sector. And that is the kind of projects that we need, it's the kind of action that we need, it's the kind of drive that I hope can be brought uh, in the current crisis. It requires us to think outside of the box if we are to create that kind of employment. And we have shown through tourism, we have shown through culture and various other initiatives that an all-island basis works. When it comes to the pound or when it comes to the euro, the borders get left behind very quickly. And we owe it to those people who are uh, unemployed today and who may not qualify ever for the, the high-tech jobs that are coming, who may not have the benefit of maths or science. We've got to look at them as well. We cannot leave them behind as we proceed on uh, the other futures that are, are widely laid out. There are small other areas. Uh, as I said, we'll focus on agriculture. I want to endorse everything that Martin has said about uh, education. We've just reached uh, a milestone uh, in education in this country, which wasn't widely celebrated, but in terms of where Martin and Sean are at, and in terms of where this country is at, it's hugely significant. Project Maths which is the concept of bringing maths and making it more attractive to students, particularly to follow it through, was examined at Junior Cert this year for the first time. And the cohort that were examined will now hopefully not 
like many of us before it, have nightmares about maths and be frightened off maths and will have the confidence to bring it through to honours uh, leaving a certain level. I'm not sure about making science a compulsory subject as someone who had an aversion to it, but what I do think we need to do is we need to make foreign languages compulsory subjects, not at secondary school, but at national school. We need uh, and a child at seven or eight will learn and have a lot less blockages about learning than a child at 12 or 13. And I think if we make languages, uh, maybe the Asian one, maybe let's just take it and go for bold on it. But when you look at the blockages that were put in the way of a relatively sim simple concept like Project Maths, um, I worry about maybe introducing Chinese or some element of Asian language into first class in national school. But unless we do it in national school, and unless we introduce languages into national school, I don't think we'll get the kind of progress that Martin and the other HPs around this island need. Uh, and I think we can see changes very quickly by, by doing it at that. I want to particularly welcome Rory Quinn's recent comments that he's going to focus on the three R's, on reading and arithmetic and on writing. I often wonder what Patrick McGill would make of the text language that all of us use at this stage and what kind of writings he would come with with RU or texting or that kind of thing. And while it's grand to joke about it, report writing and the kind of thing that we used to be good at uh, demands good English and demands the highest standards of English. And we've got to get ourselves back into that space uh, as well. Finally, um, Chairman, I can just say, for many years, uh, and again this week, Joel Holland has been like the master butcher in abattoir, lining up sacred cows, uh, as, and then send them off to slaughter for somebody else. Mm -hmm. I think we've come to the stage where we need to start slaughtering them. And, um, you know, I wish, I, I unfortunately wasn't able to make it up for the debate today, but I think the steps that the government have taken, as somebody who served in that area in terms of amalgamating public service transformation in with public expenditure. I think that will potentially drive more changes in our public service in four years than have been driven in 40 years, if it's properly driven. It can be done in that sector. It can be done in every other sector uh, as well. And I'm willing to take Martin's challenge about performing, um, and I'm willing to come back here and account for it and ultimately account uh, to the people for hopefully in four years. Um, but we've got to start taking these sacred cows, putting them up there, and asking ourselves, are you getting in the way of creating a job in this country? And if they are, shoot them. And we owe that to those who are signing on uh, all over this country tomorrow morning. Gurmeen <laughs> Mother.